The Sony PlayStation 2 originally released in the year 2000 and is the best selling video game console of all time. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech and today I'm very excited to talk about my childhood console, the PlayStation 2. I have so many fond memories of playing so many games on this thing and today we're going to take a look at it nearly 21 years later. How does it hold up? of Famer, Top Seed, Choreographer, Mastermind, Hero, World Champion, Pilot, All Pro, Entertainer, what do you want to be when you grow up? Rated E for everyone, PlayStation 2, the only place to play. You heard me right, the PS2 is almost 21 years old. It came out March 4th, 2000, which is nearly 21 years ago. And I actually was born about a month afterwards, which makes me almost 21 years old. And now I'm feeling old. But it's just another reason for me to closely identify with the PS2. I love this machine. The PS2 replaced the very, very successful PlayStation, now known commonly as the PS1, and was in direct competition with the sixth generation of consoles, the 1999 Sega Dreamcast, the 2001 Xbox, and also 2001 GameCube. And the PS2 kind of wrecked them all. Seriously, it wasn't even close. The PS2 remains to this day the best-selling console of all time, with over 155 million units sold worldwide, with the PS4 being Sony's second best-selling console at 113.5 million. That's right, the PS2 sold over 40 million more units than the PS4. In a time where I think most of us would admit video games weren't nearly as relevant in pop culture. Why was this? Well, for a multitude of reasons, actually. A big one was that the competition didn't perform very well. The original Xbox sold 24 million, the GameCube 21 million, and the Dreamcast 9 million. But I mean, the PS2 would have to be a pretty great console to steal so many sales away, right? Well, yeah, I'd say it was. It was helped by the head start it got, releasing a year before the GameCube and Xbox. Of course, the Dreamcast came out in 98, but I'm only really including it out of respect for the hardware, as it quite literally killed Sega's hopes in the console game and was discontinued in 2001. It was awesome, it actually sold pretty well considering how little time it was around, just not enough to pull them out of the hole they had dug post the Genesis era. Also, the PS2 kind of killed it in sales once it came out, it's no coincidence the Dreamcast was stopped so soon after the PS2's launch. But what the PS2 really had that drew consumers in was a built-in DVD player. Now that was huge, especially because the PS2 only costed $299 American, which shockingly was about the same price, or sometimes even less, as a standalone DVD player. Player. Meaning, either you could get just a DVD player for like $200, $300, or you get a DVD player and access to PlayStation 2 games for $300. It was kind of a no-brainer. Of course, the PS3 did something similar, having Blu-ray, which at first wasn't so successful, but it did help it in the long run, as it eventually caught up and even surpassed the Xbox 360 in sales. And the PS1 kind of did something similar, having a CD player built in, and so why buy a CD player when you could buy a PS1 and get a CD player in the process? And the PS2 remained popular well into the seventh generation of consoles, to the point where it was produced until 2013. That's right, the PS2 was produced until 2013, the year the PS4 came out. FIFA 14 actually was released for the PS2. FIFA 14, that's insane! And it's in large part because the PS2 just kept selling, even after the launch of the PS3, which had a very slow start. Now, saying it was made until 2013 is a little bit deceptive, as it was officially discontinued worldwide January 4th, of 2013, but hey, that's still 2013, the numbers don't lie. But right from the get-go with the announcement in 1999 that PlayStation 2 was a hit, it really had everything. The aforementioned DVD player was huge, but it also came with complete backwards compatibility with the original PlayStation and its accessories like the DualShock controller and the memory cards. The PS2 on day one pulled in $250 million in sales, including games and accessories, which demolished the $97 million made on the first day of the Dreamcast. Although I gotta say, 
Okay, uh, $97 million first day of the Dreamcast, not bad. Funnily enough, because we can definitely relate to nowadays, it was pretty tough to find the PS2 at release, as it was in such huge demand and the factories just couldn't keep up. Also similar to now with the PS5, the PS2 could be found on sites like eBay, where the console would go for over $1,000. I think the backwards compatibility really was a huge selling point for the PS2. All your PS1 games would just work, with no issues whatsoever, and you got a DVD player in the process. And the jump in graphics from the PS1 to the PS2 is pretty huge. Compare Gran Turismo 2 from 1999 to Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec from 2000. Interesting fact, Gran Turismo 3 is commonly considered to be one of the best racing games of all time. Going to Metacritic and ranking it by top scoring racing games, it received a 95, good enough for second place, behind, you guessed it, the first Gran Turismo. Although strangely enough, third and fourth place are both taken by iOS games, so uh, I'm not sure how seriously you can take Metacritic's rankings. Regardless, Gran Turismo 3 came out fairly soon after the launch, as in a year later, and was a very appealing reason to buy the PS2, and that wasn't the only great game to come in the early years. Although, believe it or not, the launch lineup was actually pretty bad at first. This here is a list of them from IGN. Do you recognize any of those games? I recognize some of the franchises, but very few of the individual games actually stand out. But again, PS1 backwards compatibility meant you'd still have games to play regardless. This feels again familiar with the PS5 launch, as it really doesn't have very many launch titles. But the vast, vast majority of PS4 games are playable, which is a huge bonus for buyers, including myself. But around the holiday season of 2001, a blockbuster game lineup for the PS2 helped maintain the momentum in sales and managed to keep it going above newly released rivals in the Xbox and GameCube. Sony was helped by temporarily having exclusive rights to Grand Theft Auto 3, which wouldn't hit Xbox for another two years. And then of course, Metal Gear Solid 2, which was a big hit. And as if it weren't successful enough already, Sony cut the price of the console in the May of 2002 from $299 to $199, making it the same price as the GameCube and a full $100 less than the Xbox. While Sony was ahead of the game in many ways, the Xbox was actually the more powerful system and was very innovative with Xbox Live hitting in late 2002. To try to compete, Sony released the PlayStation Network adapter at the same time, with online capable games releasing alongside it, such as the first SOCOM game. While there's no doubt that Xbox Live was the best way to play online, and it was helped with the no network adapter being necessary for the system as it was built in, Sony's online support was there, and it was a big selling point for the system. Of course, online gaming as we know it today really started in the next generation of consoles. Come the September of 2004, just in time for the launch of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Sony revealed their new, slimmer PlayStation 2 and slim it was. This is the PS2 I remember growing up with. In fact, my family has actually had two of them. I remember the first one that we had, it was probably bought pretty shortly after launch, and uh, it ended up breaking within a couple years. It couldn't read discs anymore, so my dad bought another one, which is the one we have here. It was the best console I'd have until the Christmas of 2009, when my uncle would get me and my brother the Xbox 360. But I still had years of fun with the PS2, and I absolutely loved this system. It's hard for me to think of my childhood with without thinking of the PlayStation 2, I played way too many video games. We've pretty much covered the life of the PS2 already, but there's one more model of the PS2 you may not have ever known existed, the PlayStation 2 TV. That's right, a television with the PlayStation 2 built in, because why not, I guess. It came out in 2010 and was called the Sony Bravia KDL-22PX300, offering a 22-inch LCD screen with a 720p resolution. Why anybody would ever want this, I have no idea, besides that it's kind of neat. But an even tougher question is why does it even exist in the first place? Of course the PS2 is a DVD player, so it doubled as a TV with a DVD player built in, but those existed anyways, so why? Just why? I'm gonna assume this is pretty rare nowadays, as I couldn't even find any on eBay, but as far as I can tell, it does indeed exist. But if you want to play a PS2 nowadays, you're probably gonna be looking at either the original fat model or the slim PlayStation 2. The PlayStation is alive with groups coming together. Boy band groupies mingle happily with football mascots. Meanwhile, stock market traders compete with each other to see who can put on the best display of their skills. One trader gets carried away and ends up in danger. The pit crews defend their territory fiercely. Such is life on the PlayStation. 
the original PS2 is a bit of an absolute unit. It's got a very unique design, being a matte black plastic box, but with kind of a grill looking middle area and a smaller box offset on the bottom. Apparently the design was actually based off the unreleased Atari Falcon 030, which was a micro box computer, and comparing them based off images, yeah, I can see it, there's definitely a resemblance. The PS2 was innovative in that it allowed for two different orientations. Of course, the most obvious was for the PS2 to be laid down horizontally, but it also came with a stand so you could stand it up vertically as well. And I mean, it can stand up on its own even without the stand. Mine doesn't have the stand, unfortunately, but you can see it in photos here. The PlayStation logo in the middle of the disc drive actually can rotate, something that is true for the Slim as well, and even the first PS3. On the top of the console is the PS2 logo in blue, with the PlayStation 2 wordmark ingrained to the plastic underneath it. The disc tray comes out at the push of the eject button, and will automatically pull it back in when you press it again. This is the only DVD drive of this style Sony has used, at least that I know of, with the PS3, PS4, and PS5 all having slot loading drives, where you have to put the disc in, and then it kind of eats it up. We have two controller ports on the front, yes, only two, and then two memory card slots above them. You had to buy an adapter to play with four controllers at once. We also have two USB ports on the front, as well as a Firewire port, which was dropped on newer PS2s and never utilized much. On the back of the console, we have the power supply switch and AC in. The power supply is built into this console, like the original PS1, and then we have the AV out and digital audio optical port. There's also an expansion bay where you can put in a hard drive. That's a pretty cool addition, I have to say, and it's one that PS2 enthusiasts swear by, as they use it to load all their PS2 games without the need for discs. Again, I have to say, I really like the design of this console. It's sleek, I love the matte finish, and it really feels fresh compared to the first PlayStation. The first PlayStation's design is fine, it's just very simple, and I think the PS2 looks a lot more modern. Comparing it to the PlayStation 5, and, well, the original PS2 no longer feels large. The PS5 looks like a monster compared to it, although I guess it really looks like a monster compared to any console, as it's just huge. Hard to believe there's 20 years between these two consoles, but there is, and while the PS5's design is strange, to say in the least, it's definitely a lot more modern and even futuristic looking. But this PS2 isn't the only model. We of course also have the PS2 Slim from 2004, which is mind-blowingly small in comparison. How on earth Sony managed to shrink their console so significantly is beyond me. There's no built-in power supply and no hard drive bay, but beyond that, it's pretty much the same machine, just tiny. This has to be the smallest mainline console of all time, right? It's sleek, it's lights, and I absolutely love it. The PS2 Slim was Sony's best console until the PS3 came out two years later. Comparing it to the PS5 is like talking about David versus Goliath. So when the PS2 Slim came out, again, it was the best console Sony offered. Do you imagine today if Sony released a PS5 as small as the PS2, or even like triple the size? That would be mind-blowing and just wouldn't happen. I think Sony deserves a lot of respect for making the Slim. Back in 2004, going to buy a new console, if you were a little torn on the Xbox versus the PS2, this is what you would be looking at. Now, the Xbox is huge on its own, but looking at it versus the PS2 Slim, and it's almost laughable, the size difference. Now, if it helps, the Xbox 360 would only come out a year later in 2005, but still, I just think the Slim is super cool. The PS2 Slim's DVD reader goes the same style as the PS1, as in when you hit the eject button, the top flips open. I much prefer this, as less moving parts means less breakable parts, and I know for a fact there were a decent amount of people eventually having issues with the DVD tray on their original PS2s, but that can't happen here, and I also just like popping the cover up and clicking it in because it's somehow very satisfying. From the front, the PS2 Slim is very similar to the first one, with two controller slots and two memory card slots. PS2 memory cards contained 8 megabytes of data, that's right, 8 megabytes, and you can access what's on your memory card by booting the console without a disc. I love this UI, it's so much fun with the little icons for each game you have saved. This is my memory card I've been using since the first PS2 we got, and man, it's gone through a lot. So many saved games deleted over the years to make space. I kind of regret a lot of that, as it would have been cool if they were still here, but when you're a kid and don't have the money to just buy another memory card, you don't have much choice. So the vast, vast majority of my old saves are gone, though interestingly, I do still have a save of Sonic Heroes from 2006 on here. That's really cool to me. I would have been six years old when I made this. It's very weird to think about. I actually got Sonic Heroes for my sixth birthday, and I, I kind of remember that. It's cool to look at old saves, and 8 megabytes does seem like a really small size now, and it is, but at the inception of the PS2 in 2000, it wasn't unreasonable. It also shares the same format as PS1 memory cards, which only had one megabyte, and can still be used on the PS2. It's 
worth mentioning that the PS2 has been exploited and homebrewed to high heaven at this point. It's pretty easy to run burnt games and anything you can think of on there, or even emulators if you look into it. There's a big community for it. Um, I won't be talking about it today, but it is a thing if you want to look into it. But it does lead to me talking about the most important thing about the PlayStation 2. Not the console itself, not the DVD player, not the massive amount of sales, but the gigantic game library and the unending amount of classics for this system. Oh, why not a couple of pictures and then go home? Anybody you recognize here? Nah. Huh? I don't hang out with animals, man. But I don't Which one is he? Does this ring a bell? Which uh, one? You sitting here lying to me, wasting my time. You're a liar, and I know you're a liar. Get out of me here. Is it this one? I don't know that one, huh? Sly Cooper, he's one cunning, devious, devious raccoonus. Ready to for everyone. No console is complete without a great selection of games, and the PlayStation 2 is no exception. And man, are there ever a lot of games. We're talking over 3,800 game titles released for the PS2 with over 1.5 billion copies sold. Obviously with that many games you're going to have a lot of shovelware, or in other words, terrible games pumped out for a quick buck, but we also have a ridiculous amount of classic titles. Seriously, it would take me a full hour just to talk about some of these games, so I'll just mention a few. Don't be offended if your favorite game not here, these are just ones I could think of. Tony Hawk, Pro Skater 3, Final Fantasy, Burnout, Shadow of the Colossus, Guitar Hero, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, Ratchet and Clank, Gran Turismo 3 and 4, Jack and Daxter, God of War, Okami, Silent Hill 2, Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas, Dragon Quest, Resident Evil 4, The Sly Cooper Trilogy, Simpsons Hidden Run, Prince of Persia, Devil May Cry 3, Persona 4, Spider-Man 2, and dozens upon dozens more. These are just some of what are considered to be the best gaming has to offer, and they're all found on the PlayStation 2. There are so many great games on this system. Seriously, go look up best games for PS2, and you'll see completely different titles on each list, of course with a common few, but there's just so many games for the platform that everyone has a different opinion on the best of the best, and that's awesome. For me, my favorites for the PS2 have always been the Sly Trilogy, uh, specifically Sly 2 Band of Thieves. It still remains my second favorite game of all time, right behind Skyrim. I won't go into it much, but it was a stealth-based game where you'd run around many open worlds doing various missions. For someone under 10 years old that had never really experienced anything with an open world, it blew my mind. I'm sure I played the Sly Cooper games the most on the PS2, but uh, there are lots of other titles I enjoyed. Those are just uh, some of the ones we owned. My family collected quite a few over the years. Uh, there's there's more, trust me, there's more. Uh, NHL 05 may be kind of an obscure title, but I played a lot of NHL 05 as a kid. I think I liked it so much because it had my favorite hockey player, Marcus Naslin, on the front of it. Oh, and of course, I can't forget my favorite racing game of all time, Gran Turismo 4. It came out in 2004, it was probably the reason my dad got the PS2 in the first place. It improved on Gran Turismo 3, and it was one of the best looking games graphically to be on the PS2. It's also unique in that it supports up to 1080i in resolution if you have the right setup, one of the very few games to do so on the PS2. Most games play at 480p, a resolution that looks pretty good on old TVs, but pretty darn bad on modern ones. Hooking up the PS2 to my 65-inch 4K TV, isn't exactly a pleasant experience. And graphics on the PS2 are hard to judge nowadays. A lot of the more realism-based games are just not going to look very good anymore. And that's because we've progressed so far in that department, but what really hurts it more than anything is the lack of high definition. Even 720p feels like a big jump over this. This right here being shown is from my actual PS2 Slim, by the way, recorded via capture card. Games are still mostly easy to find for this console in wide abundance on the used market, and in mom and pop video game stores. The console was so popular, most games are dirt cheap to pick up nowadays. Unfortunately, there's no way to play these games on PS5, at least yet, although some select games are available to stream on PlayStation Now or able to be purchased and downloaded through the PlayStation Store, but there's no backwards compatibility beyond the very first PlayStation 3, which could play PS2 games, but that feature was quickly removed, and even my own fat PS3 isn't backwards compatible. It's really unfortunate that there's no official option to play PS2 
games in high definition without resorting to emulation, at least assuming the game you want to play hasn't been re-released on a better system. Now there is a really good PS2 emulator and with it you can upscale games to higher resolutions and nowadays that's probably the best way to play PS2 games, but it's so much nicer to play these games on an actual console. Hopefully Sony will eventually bring some kind of backwards compatibility. We all know the PS5 can emulate the PS2 no problem. Streaming with PlayStation now is literally streaming and so that's a pretty bad way to play. And seeing how the vast majority of original Xbox and Xbox 360 games are available on Xbox One and the new Xbox, it's pretty sad to see that Sony hasn't shown the same support for their old games. It's hard to make excuses for the PS5. Hopefully they do something about it. At least it plays PS4 games, I guess. Let's quickly look at the PlayStation 2 DualShock 2 controller. It's easy to mistake for the PS3 controller, or would be if not for the wire, as without it, it's practically identical. It's got basic rumble functionality and it looks quite similar to the original PS1 controller, just with analog sticks. And it's basically identical to the first DualShock controller that came for the PS1 later. I don't have too many complaints here. I do think the controller is a bit uncomfortable for long periods of time as it is quite small, but generally speaking it does the job and it does it well. The triggers don't slowly push in like they do on newer controllers, but instead are just basic buttons that you tap. But beyond that, PlayStation controllers haven't really changed a whole lot, at least up to the DualShock 4 controller. Of course, now we have the DualSense controller, which is not only the best controller I've ever used, but it also looks quite a bit more unique as you can see here. Still though, despite being nearly 21 years old, the PS2 controller holds its own. The PlayStation 2 is a remnant of another era. It sold so well with so many games, and while it has very little relevance 21 years later, it's remembered by those who played it as what it is, one of the greatest video game consoles of all time. There's a reason it's sold so well, and it's not just the DVD player. It's a fantastic machine with an amazing lineup of games, and there's no doubt in my mind that I'll always love my PS2. It's such a joy to pull it out and set it up. Sometimes me and my brother will just play a multiplayer game on it. For a moment, for a brief moment, when playing the PS2, it almost feels like you're back in the early 2000s, experiencing games just like you did when you were younger. Then you snap out of it and end up going back to your PS5, but hey, the PS2 is still a pretty fun time. The graphics and resolutions might be a bit rough, but the gameplay is still very solid, and there's a good chance that there'll never be another console that matches what the PS2 accomplished. But that's coming from me, someone who grew up with the PS2 and is uh, clearly quite fond of it. So I want to hear from you. Did you ever have a PS2? Here's a good question for today. Uh, what was your favorite game for the PlayStation 2? Doesn't have to be an exclusive at all. It could just come during that era. There's just so many fun games from that time. Uh, I, I kept remembering different ones as I was writing the script for this video. Like, of course, I love the Sly Cooper trilogy, but there's others too. Like, yeah, SOCOM 2 or The Simpsons Hit and Run or Burnout 3 Takedown. You get the picture. So many great games. And choosing only one as a favorite isn't easy. But uh, good luck and comment it down below. If you found this nostalgic trip through the PlayStation 2's life interesting, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech if you'd like to keep up. And with that all being said, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.